Uh, so my name's Chris. Uh, I, I am a principal at AWH. Uh, my official title there is the Chief Product Officer because one of my jobs is to understand what our clients are trying to accomplish and the product that we're building for them, the technology around it, the market around it, the competitive analysis, the pricing models, all those kind of things. So that, that, all that's sort of under my um, scope uh, at AWH. For the past probably four to five years, I've also been the chief technology officer for Include Health, which is uh, coming out of Cincinnati. Um, and I've been working with that team to build out their product and uh, take it to market. Um, if you don't know what Include Health is, it'd be worth a look um, just from a, you know, a, um, a multifunctional fitness machine that was built for um, people with disabilities to be able to still exercise to it morphed into a cloud platform. It then we added uh, sensors that now we can put on any piece of fitness equipment. And then it's modified and, and, and morphing more into um, some of the things we're going to talk about today from ML and AI implementations. <clears throat> the reason why this talk is better today than it was then is because the entire spring with the pandemic, uh, two things happened. One, I learned to get very comfortable with Zoom and talking to a panel of uh, screens uh, versus in-person, face-to-face, which I also like. Uh, the second is we've spent a ton of time heads down into uh, ML and training models for the types of things that we want to accomplish across a number of our clients. And um, I've been sort of spearheading most of the R&D on that, so I'm very hands-on. One of, I think, uh, and you'll be the judge of this, but one of the things I've been told is I can take a complex subject and sort of talk to, um, look, this is what you really need to know, and here's sort of the, the, sim the, the, the simple way to approach you know, this particular kind of thing. So this uh, particular presentation is new, so you guys are seeing it for the first time. Um, it's uh, still being baked, so if I shake it, the inside still probably jiggles, right? So it's not it's not completely baked yet. And um, but we're going to go experiment together through this particular talk, and you know you guys can give me feedback on it. The first eh, ten or fifteen slides, I just want to give you some education as to what machine learning is and the approaches to machine learning. Um, then we're going to be super interactive and we're going to go play with some models and we're going to go, uh, then at the very end, we're going to train some stuff and we're going to do that live while everyone's on this call um, because machine learning isn't something that needs to be, um, uh, you know, don't want to be offensive, but you don't need to lock data scientists in a room and you don't, you don't necessarily need to have a PhD to get started. Now, commercialization of machine learning, you, you probably want people who have a lot of experience doing it, but for you to experiment with your business and go, hey, I'm, I wonder if I can solve this kind of problem. There's a lot of uh, resources out there that are available to you that you'll be able to uh, look at. And this particular talk is aimed at um, showing you some of those resources so you can go play with it yourself, right? You don't necessarily need to know really anything about code. Um, I'm going to be showing you some code uh, and I'll explain what it is as we go. And I'll, I'll just tell you the important parts, not all the parts. Um, but that's really what this talk is about. So the, the other weird thing about uh, uh, Zoom calls is screen sharing, right? Where I'm like, hey, I'm going to share my screen. Not you, I don't need to share my screen. But what I do need you to do is take this panel out of um, uh, to sort of tile mode, if it's in tile mode, put it in speaker mode and then pin me so I don't uh, jump off the screen because I'm going to just swap my video feed in for all my presentation and screens. So that way um, we, we don't have to deal with, okay, I'm going to share a different screen. Now I'm going to jump out and share a different screen, right? So with that being said, if you've done that, uh, what you should now see is my presentation, right? I can still see you. I can still read your chats. I can still see you, you know, wandering off into the, into the, like, um, I'm not paying attention. So I'm still watching you. You just get to watch my uh, slide deck. All right. So here's what we're going to do. Um, we're going to talk about machine learning at a one-on-one level. So this isn't, you know, your, your 700 series um, machine learning where we're going to talk about, you know, complex uh, things. Um, 
what we're going to talk about is what is machine learning, the different ways that we build models, um, what models are, and then we're going to go play. Right? So uh, what's the difference between machine learning and AI? We get this all the time. Um, and I used to start off with the fact that if someone says machine learning, just substitute the word math, right? Because that's really what's going on here is a bunch of math. Right? But what's the difference between machine learning and AI? Machine learning uses data and training techniques to build a model. That's really what our goal here is. Artificial intelligence is the application of those models. Right? And if you just sort of go on the surface, that's what we're talking about, is machine learning allows us to take data, do something with that data, and then build a model that we can consume. Artificial intelligence is the use of those models to solve problems. So it's sort of it's a two-step kind of thing. So as we go through this, we're going to talk about data training and models, and then we're going to talk about consumption, which is the other side, which is once I build the model, what can I do with it? The other thing to, to think about during this is there is not one model that rules them all, right? So there is no sort of general artificial intelligence that can do everything. We build models for specific problems, and we're going to talk through some of those examples as we go, but understand that one model typically doesn't, isn't enough in a solution. And when we're building AI based applications or, um, and we try to bake, now we try to bake AI into most of the things that we're doing because it solves problems um, without a lot of code. But uh, it's normally not one model. It is multiple models working together to get us to sort of an end result. So uh, there's three easy steps uh, to machine learning. Now, uh, one is data, the second one is your training, and the third one is your consumption, all right? So data, train, and consume is sort of the process that we are going to go through from an ML perspective. And unfortunately, I forget who brought it up that said they really wanted to talk about data and data uh, modeling. Uh, we're not going to talk about data at all, all right? There are many talks about, hey, how do you want to set up your data? How do you want to do your labeling? How do you want to do those kind of things? We're just going to assume that you have some data that you know what to do with. Um, and it's got some structure and we're going to go with it. Um, so we're going to focus here on uh, training and then consuming uh, ML. Because uh, if, if I brought up um, you know, a database and started doing select queries and started exporting data and those kind of, you all would gloss over and then um, drop, off them, drop off the call at some point and then hate this talk. So let's keep it to the fun stuff, which is actually training and consuming models. Right? So uh, training models, there's, there's a number of different ways that we can build a model, right? And depending on what we want the model to do and what we're doing with that model depends on how we're going to actually train that model. So, um, and th this is, I swear to God, this is the, the limit to the technical sort of backgrounding kind of things here, but there's really three big ways that we deal with models at this training models at this point. One is supervised, where we start with something called labeled data, lots of labeled data. So I need to know what that data is, what the columns stand for, what they mean, you know, those kind of things. We split that data set into pieces, could be two, three, four, depends on, you know, how, how robust we want our models to be. We train that model, we test the model. So what I do is we will take one, let's say we have, you know, just make up numbers. We have a thousand records, right? And I'm going to take 500 records and I'm going, and I know what those records are and I know the results. And a, a great example of this that you can wrap your head around is there's a data set out there that was a data set about the people who survived the Titanic and who didn't survive the Titanic. Right. So there's a data set that says, hey, this is the person's name. This is their age. This is their their um, what class, uh, uh, what level that they were in in the ship um, when they bought their ticket. Were they with other people? Did they have siblings? Did they have children with them? Were they male? Were they female? Right. This is this data set that really says who was on the Titanic. And then there's a, a label out there that says, did they live? Right. So I've got I've got the truth in did this person live or did this person not live through the Titanic? So what I can do is I can take that list of all the Titanic people that were on the Titanic, I can split it into two pieces. Um, one of them are 
what we know is the correct answer for that person. The other one is we know the correct answer, but we're not going to tell the model the correct answer. We'll train the model on did this person live or not live and let it look for patterns between the people that lived and didn't live. We then can generate a model. We'll do that a bunch of times, not just once, but we do it over and over and over. Then we mix some of the other data in and see if it still reacts correctly. And then we mix some of the other data in and we test that model to see if I now give them somebody who lived, does it, does it have a high percentage confidence that that person lived through the Titanic or not? And if my model is, starts to get good at predictive, then I know, okay, I can live with this model and then we roll it forward. And then we can add data that we don't know the answer to. Like for instance, if I bought a third class ticket and I was a male traveling alone, what's the likelihood I survived the Titanic disaster? Very low. But if I was a woman who was in the first class compartment and I had children with me, there's a very high probability that I survived the Titanic. And the models, we should be able to run data through the models and see that kind of interaction, right? And that's supervised learning. We know the answer to all of the data in the system. And then once we train the model, we give it data that we don't know the answer to, and it will give us a prediction as to what the answer is likely to be based on that data, right? Most of the things that we deal with at this point are supervised models. We've, we know the truth. We know what we want to get out of the model. We train it over lots and lots and lots and lots of data. And then we have a model that we can introduce new data to that we may not know the truth of, and it will predict the truth for us. And that's what supervised learning is. Good example of this, um, house pricing. Right, so we have data on houses and square footage and the number of rooms and whether it had a garden and a pool and you know, any kind of information about that house. The price of the house and then by leveraging that data from thousands of houses, not only in our area, but across the nation, we can start building models that should be able to tell us what the price per square foot of a particular house is based on all the amenities and all of the assets that that particular house has, right? So this is a supervised learning model. We add more and more data to it as we go. So um, we retrain this model constantly. So as new data comes into the system, new houses come online, new houses get sold because that's the truth. What did the number that the house actually gets sold for? Then updates our predictive models and then we can get better and better at it. You know, Zillow and Redfin and all those use these kinds of models to figure out when you put your house in, you go, I live at this address and it goes enter based on the base information that it has from county records and MLS, it will give you a predictive model. And then the reason why they ask you for more things like, hey, uh, does it have a pond view? Does it have a swimming pool? Does it have a garden? Does it have a whatever? Is that there, you are training your house data to allow a model to be more accurate with those particular pricing mechanisms, right? So house pricing is a good one. Image classification. Um, Image classification, which we're gonna actually work on here in a little bit, is, um, hey, we wanna know what is this a picture of? And how do we do that? We take many, many, many pictures of things. Um, and then uh, we know what that is a picture of. Like in the beginning, when there's, when there's no model, we take a picture of a cat and take a picture of a dog, right? And we know it's a cat and we know it's a dog, but the computer doesn't. So we tell it this is a picture of a cat and this is a picture of a dog. And then what happens is the more dogs and cats and bananas and monkeys and cars and those, the image classification gets smarter and smarter until we have a model that when I can show it something novel, something it's never seen before, it can predict what that thing is with a confidence factor. So um, image classification is a example of supervised learning. Uh, text sentiment. Um, which is essentially language classification and it's context by words associate, word association. And then by training a model to recognize sentiment is something good or bad, happy, sad, you know, those kind of things. We can filter and monitor like social media for negative comments on our channel. So if someone mentions AWH and they, they go, these people suck, um, I want to know that. So I can build a model that just sits there and watches for that kind of sentiment about how people are talking about it. And eventually the sentiment filters get smart enough to understand sarcasm, right? Because that's a unique language kind of thing that we want a model to understand. So we can train models to actually understand sarcasm and context amongst 
multiple messages and what is going on in a conversation. So, but that's supervised learning. We understand what, what words mean. We understand the relationship amongst words. And then we can understand and train for if this word combination or these words are used in context, is it good or is it bad, right? So, um, and again, we're going to actually go use some of these kind of things. There's something called unsupervised learning. And unsupervised learning we use when we start with a pile of data and we don't actually know what it means. We don't have labels on it, right? So um, if you think of stock market data, that is labeled data. I know what the ask price is. I know what the sell price is. I know what the current price is. I know when the transaction dates are. I know everything about that. That, that would be supervised. Unsupervised learning is when we have um, a good example that we sort of, um, if, if I was a large library um, uh, or a large uh, organization that tracks li library records for other libraries, uh, I have lots of data coming in and I'm not exactly sure, it's not structured, it, they, sometimes it's structured, but it's all structured differently. But there are a lot of times talking about the same kinds of things, books or media or CDs or those kinds of things. But um, unfortunately, as data flows into that system, it is not structured. Like we, they don't always call it an author. Some, they have different words for things. So unsupervised learning allows us to create patterns which then allow us to tag or or make sense of the data as it's coming in and then we can pass that that newly tagged or newly labeled data off to a supervised model so unsupervised learning a lot of time is used when we don't know what we need to know so it allows us to search for patterns amongst or among um, unrelated what we perceive as unrelated data right so unsupervised learning is is a is sort of a complex task uh, so we're going to ignore that for the rest of this talk um, so this is a good example uh, what makes a good loan risk right so uh, the bank collects a lot of information from you when you do a loan um, not only your name and your your um, you know, social security number and your current salary and you know your credit history and all those kind of things um, but they ask for things that they don't need like your age and your date of birth and your gender and your race and there's no reason that that normally or that currently doesn't have any impact in your credit worthiness right so what they want to be able to do is what information actually makes a difference when I'm making a loan. And so I may have a set of data that is a hundred columns wide, as an example, and realize by analyzing loans that have been successful, I could really narrow that down to the 26 columns that actually make a good loan. I don't really care about the other 74 columns in that particular data set. So I collect it. I can get rid of them and just deal with the 26 items that actually make a difference when I do a loan. Right? That's when we would use unsupervised learning to do that kind of work. And then the last type of, of learning is reinforcement. So supervised learning gives us the ability to um, go, hey, I've got this data. And then I know the truth of this data and I want this data then to a, uh, enlighten me on data that I don't know the truth to, right? Unsupervised learning is the concept where I have a lot of data and I'm not sure what, how it relates to each other or what it means. Reinforcement learning is I have no data, right? So I'm not starting with a large data set, either labeled or unlabeled. What I'm doing is I'm, I'm training an agent I'm allowing the agent to understand the environment that it's operating in, and then I'm giving it a goal. And then I let the computer do the rest of the work. And the computer is then figures out how to maximize its goal. And um, we're going to cover a reinforcement learning um, example uh, in a sort of a fun way here. But uh, reinforcement learning is a great way to um, 
to train a computer to continuously learn based on goal setting, right? Um, so when we, I don't know if, if anyone here has seen the movie, The Social Dilemma. If you haven't seen the movie, The Social Dilemma, I would recommend watching the movie, The Social Dilemma. Many of the algorithms that are used in social media are reinforcement, where the, the AI is given a goal, in, in that particular example for social media, your goal is to maximize screen time because that maximizes our advertising revenue. So as that is the goal, the machine figures out how to keep people connected to it and how to make you scroll to the next item and scroll to the next item, right? That is a reinforcement model that is running continuously in the background. So it's not supervised data where they went, here's every post that someone has made and here's every like that they made and here's that. Now, based on that, here's the truth of this person, All right? That doesn't work. Unsupervised data says, hey, uh, we're not sure what the data is and how it relates to each other and those kind of things. And, and But that gets us to a supervised learning model. Reinforcement learning is we, we want this to happen. Computer, we want you to figure this out. I'm not going to give you any data to start with. I'm just going to feed data from your environment to you and you will then figure out how to maximize whatever that goal is. And that's what reinforcement learning is. Right? So those are the, those are the sort of top three. There's a bunch of other ones, right? And underneath each one of these, not to minimize uh, them, but the, underneath each one of these are hundreds of ways to actually solve that problem. So if we talk about supervised learning, there's you know, KNN, nearest, nearest means, there's, there's just a number of ways and algorithms that you can apply to solving the particular problem that you're trying to solve, right? But if we just look across the landscape and go, what are the big three? Those are the big three. Can you guys hear Chris? His, um, somebody, can you hear him, Roger? Okay, thanks. No. Oh. I've recorded entire sessions of things with my mic turned off. So I'm glad that's not happening here. So, <clears throat> all right. So examples of, uh, of uh, reinforcement learning, a self-driving car, right? There's the, the concept that you, if you've written any code, there is no way you can write enough code to build a self-driving car. You cannot if then else your way into a self-driving car. Meaning there's no way that you can write enough code to take care of every situation that you might ever encounter in a car that's trying to drive itself down the road. You just can't do it. There's not enough code on the planet. And then just imagine the defects. Ugh. So what we've done is we said, okay, hey, let's make that a, uh, a reinforcement problem. It's not one model. It's multiple models working together in a self-driving car. So we can look at um, adaptive cruise control which is a model, right? And yeah, um, and I, for, as a thought experiment at one point, I wrote an adaptive cruise control algorithm that was very hard coded. That went, hey, I, I'm looking at my speed, I'm looking at my uh, distance between the object in front of me or not, I'm looking at the closing rate between those two objects, and then I'm looking at you know, my braking um, algorithm that then would go, okay, how, how much on a spectrum of zero to 100 should I be applying the brakes, those kind of things. You can write that code, but um, you can't write lane assist as straight code. That, hey, I'm on a, I'm on a highway, I, I may see a line on one side, I may see dotted lines on the other side, I may not see lines at all. I may be looking for just the edges of a road. I may be uh, augmenting that with GPS data, right? You can't write that code. So what we have to do is we have to train models that can understand it. And how did we train those models? We allowed the, the models to capture data as millions of drivers drove their cars. So the humans have been teaching the machines how to drive a car for years. Every Tesla on the road is really a, a data input into a reinforcement learning model that goes, okay, I'm getting smarter, I'm getting smarter, I'm getting smarter based on how all these people drive. Um, the implicit bias is what if we're watching sucky drivers, right? A terrible driver is going to introduce terrible driving into the system. Now, there, there's a great book uh, called Fuzzy Logic that I read when I was a teenager. And uh, hey, don't judge me. 
Uh, so as a teenager, I read this book called Fuzzy Logic, and uh, it's, it was ancient then, but basically it was the concept that there is no truth. There is only a number from zero to 100. And everything that we believe is truth is on that scale, right? Now, it may be 100 on that scale that we believe, but if you, the, the concept is if you asked 100 people to write the letter A, normally 100 people should be able to do it. Well, what if one does it wrong? And the computer is then trained on 99 correct A's and one wrong A, right? The computer will never be 100% confident in any of its values that is coming back when it goes, that's an A. But it doesn't look like that one that that one person put in. So I'm going to give it a 99, right? And that's really why machine learning, you, you will never come back with a 100% sure probability of an answer is because some data somewhere could have violated that. You know, some, some picture of a cat uh, was actually a picture of a fox. And so when that got ingested into the data set, um, now every time it sees a picture of a fox, even though it's seen 50,000 pictures of foxes, it still isn't completely sure that that's not a cat, right? And so that's, that's uh, one of the, the problems with ML. But for self-driving cars, um, the reason why that we don't have a generalized self-driving car at this point that can handle all weather conditions, all temperatures, all lighting conditions is because we just don't have a set of, of uh, reinforcement models that have been trained on all of those things yet. And that's what the car companies are working on. I mean, that's really what they're, what they're after. And that's why Tesla is trying to really push into that space. They've built their own computers in order to uh, reinforcement learn on the fly. So I wonder how would you guide businesses that are looking at their issues and thinking, should I use a machine learning as um, a possible solution for this particular um, problem or a question? Um, what is a good criteria for the, those questions? Um, uh, good, uh, good question. You're, you're preempting me on some of our final kinds of conversations, mm -hmm. but um, to answer that, what, what I would look at is uh, complexity of scope and the sort of uh, agility to uh, solve that particular problem. As soon as I run into a, a solution where, um, so w one slide later on is um, a slide that's, um, I'm just gonna go to it. We're all friends here, right? I'm just gonna to jump to this other slide. Um, oh, it was the next slide. Ah, you were, good job leading us. <laughs> um, so uh, there's something called the universal function approximator theory, right? Um, and machine learning is a universal function approximator. A function uh, for non-programmers is where I take some data in, I do some kind of code, and I put some data out, like I return it to you. Uh, think of an easy, uh, easy function is the function for math called add. We all know what that does. If I take one number or two numbers in, I put them together and I give you one number back, right? I have two inputs, one output. All right, so I'll, I'll leave this particular screen. So two inputs, one output. Well, a function actually put those numbers together, right? And it's easy for us to go, well, yeah, that, I mean, that's simple code. I would write that in you know, one line. Great. Um, now let's talk about very complex things that um, couldn't take in or, or that would be very difficult for a programmer to write. Um, for instance, uh, the, the going back to the Titanic one, which is one of my favorite ones for some reason. I, I don't know, maybe it's because it's starting to get Halloween and it's, it's a good topic, but um, that if you had to write every if statement or every switch statement to figure out the answer to that particular question, you would get lost because eventually the code, the, the, the complexity of the code becomes too much for even the developers that are writing it to understand, at which point, you're sort of stuck because then uh, the next developer in the next developer in mutates that code to a point where um, you're not then able to even understand the how you were trying to approach the problem because not one person did it. That is the example where I would say, okay, from a business perspective, you should go over and start looking at ML to solve that particular problem because the, com the, the functions, inputs and outputs are too complex in the function to actually have a human follow through with all the logic necessary. Plus, 
uh, at that point, it is, it's more economic and time uh, uh, valued uh, to put a model in place and just call the model. To train a model and put a model in place for those kinds of things are pretty straightforward today. Now, five years ago, it was a lot more difficult, but the, the advances that we've made in all of our underlying ML tools are to the point where I would lean towards ML for anything that's more than just simple, you know, kind of things, right? Uh, if I've got a form and it takes in a, 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 a new login and they hit go and I stuff that in a database, I don't need ML. Um, if I want to make sure they don't have an account, I don't need ML, right? Um, but if I want to understand what I'm going to recommend to them next, I will need ML because I need to understand their profile versus other people's profiles as to other people's actions and all those kind of things. There's just not enough code you can write to actually solve that problem. So as a business, I would look at when does code become unmaintainable and unusable? I would look at ML at that point and solve that problem that way. We do a lot and we, we do a lot of small models in the middle of existing code and it becomes very handy. Um, a good example is um, for include uh, health. We have a vision system that can track the human body I and mean, I can tell you where all your joints are and the angles between the joints and all those kind of things. Um, but I need, uh, we were doing a assessment for a physical therapy um, and I needed to tell if someone was sitting down before they started the assessment, right? So once they stand up, I want the assessment to start. And once they sit back down, I want the assessment to stop. You, you would have a difficult time writing code that allowed you to build a system just based on numbers and if then else and switch statements to let me know if someone is sitting down or standing up. The easier and faster way, in fact, the three-day way that we solved that problem was we introduced a ton of pictures of people sitting down and a ton of pictures of people standing up and trained a model to know the difference between the body positions and uh, plug that into the middle of the, of the software. And now it don't, doesn't start until the person's sitting down. And there's really no code to maintain at that point. The model's the model, the model's built. So, I would, from a business perspective, you need to start thinking along those lines. Whenever your programmers tell you it's super complex, you should start looking at ML. I'm rambling, but there you go. Hope that answered your question. All right, so go back to this. Um, uh, universal uh, function approximator. So whenever we make a function that takes data in and spits some data out or mutates that, that whatever's going on inside of it and gives it back. That's all machine learning is actually doing. It's taking inbound data and it's, and it's typically responding back with some other piece of information, right? If we, if we look at um, uh, the, the body pose estimation kind of models that we use, um, it takes in a image of a person. It's actually a video, but frame by frame, it takes in an image of a person. It applies a model that says, where are their joints? And then out of that model, frame by frame, I get a data set that says their left elbow is right here. Their right elbow is right here. Here's an X, Y coordinate on that image. And then here's the probability that the machine model is happy with, right? So if the machine model goes, mm, I think the left elbow is right here, but I'm only 20% confident, I may not want to use that data. But if the machine, uh, machine uh, is, or the model says that left elbow is right here and I am 92% sure, then I do want to use that piece of data because that means it's a high probability that that model knows what the heck's going on with that particular joint. And then we can build applications on top of that data. And we didn't, there would be no way for us to build those applications without having that model in place. And then we actually feed that model data output into other models like the sit stand models, right? That what happens is that data is flowing through and we're taking that data and passing it in as an input to another model. And the output of that data, that particular model gets passed in as input to another model. And so we can chain models together to get our final, here's what we want to do and here's how it works. So there you go. 
We're at, oop, 15 minutes left. We, we gotta hurry. So I'm going to now uh, go to this next slide, which is I think our last slide in this deck. All right, so let's go play. All right, and uh, the first thing we're going to do is uh, we're going to have we're going to have a computer learn how to beat Flappy Bird. Oops, let me go back. Um, so the Flappy Bird game, we're going to have a computer learn how to beat that. All right. So I'm going to switch over to a different screen here. I'm going to get rid of you guys off the screen. I'm going to get rid of you guys off the screen. And um, we're going to go and play Flappy Bird. So you guys uh, know what Flappy Bird, well, maybe you don't, but Flappy Bird is this game where you start with this little character and your goal is to get them through the pipes, right? And uh, it was super, super fun to play and got super addictive there for a long time on the internet. Um, but we don't wanna play Flappy Bird. We wanna teach a computer how to play Flappy Bird. So what we're gonna do is we're going to build a Flappy Bird game and then we're going to let a reinforcement learning model figure out how to maximize its score. So what we're doing here is we're starting with 50 birds at a time, and then we're going to watch its generation score. So it says generation six. What's happening is the computer is learning how to do this game because every time it can increase its score, it looks back and says, how, how did that happen? It, it doesn't know anything about these pipes when, the, when we first started. It doesn't know anything other than if I hit the space bar or the equivalent for a computer of hitting the space bar, this bird will do this little jumpy thing. And that is it. That's the only thing it knows. So it tries over and over to, as an agent, to hit its goal. And its goal is to increase its score. So it's trying everything it can over and over and over to try to increase its score. And so it tries all kinds of things, right? So now we're, we're 50 times 17 uh, games into this particular system, right? And uh, I can speed it up a little bit because it's a computer playing against itself. So it's like, ah, okay. And, oh, okay. And, and it just, and you start rooting for it. You're like, come on, computer, you can do it. Come on. Oh, 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 oh figure one out. Oh. And so as the computer goes through generation after generation of learning, and this is exactly what a self-driving car has done, uh, other than it doesn't run into pipes. Well, it did initially, right? Because we just run simulations on some of those kind of things. Um, so as we start to go through, okay, we're at generation 34, seems to have figured some stuff out, but not big jumps yet. So now it's going after, oh, and still not there. And... All right, figured that one out, couldn't get there. So how's it gonna do that? And we'll start going faster and faster just to get through our generations. Normally, I'm, this particular game will run between eh, 50 and 100 generations uh, before we have a, it's almost flawless at that point. So while we're sitting on this call, we've now run 44 generations. It's got its max score at 675. Oh, just beat it. Uh, learning. go faster. And at some point, like I said, typically around generations between, yeah, 50 and 70, sometimes 100, it becomes flawless at this game. And this is not me passing in a bunch of data to a model. This is me telling a model that we want you to figure out how to play this game and your goal is to increase the score. And that's the only thing we told it other than the fact they can hit a space bar. Right. And that's what it's doing right now. So while we've sat on this call, we've trained a, um, a reinforcement learning model to play the game Flappy Bird. And what's amazing is the, the code behind this is pretty minimal. Um, now, at this point, when I've done this presentation, people, people get upset when I stop it because they want to see if it will just keep going. And it will. Um, if we just speed it up, it will it'll keep playing this thing forever until it comes into a situation it hasn't encountered before, like a self-driving car in the middle of winter at night on a slick road. And then it has to learn again and it has to learn the next thing. Uh, but right now, yeah, it, 
pretty much has Flappy Bird figured out in about 52 generations of learning. All right? So everyone, everyone good with me stopping this? <laughs> Like, no, I want to see it fail again. No, okay, all right. So the code around that, um, we use um, a, uh, this is actually JavaScript. So we use a modeling tool that allows us to do um, genetic reproduction. So one generation teaches the next generation as to what it learned. And that's how we do that. We, re we push that back. So as, as one bird runs into a pole, it, tells the next generation don't run into a pole. One generation can't make it above a, uh, into an opening because it didn't flap soon enough. It tells the next generation to go do that, right? And then of course the, the game itself is pretty straightforward. It's, it's just a simple game that some guy wrote and uh, we've got that there. So, um, the, so we just trained a, a reinforcement learning model to play flat paper. So the next thing that we're going to look at is a project called ML5. And we started here with a lot of the things that we do. So if you go to ml5js.org, um, this is something that you guys can use right now to do machine learning on the web. Um, and this is a great place to start. And here's a good beginner's guide to machine learning with ML5. And it's very approachable. Um, first of all, it's it's JavaScript based, so I don't need a, I don't need Python, I don't need R, I don't need a bunch of tools that we normally would think of in classic uh, ML. Um, but uh, I can I can work with it from here. Um, so if we look at it, when we when, there's a whole bunch of different things we can do. First of all, there's neural network, there's feature extractors, there's classifiers, um, but they give you some pre-built models that you can play with and not only image models, but also sound models and text models. All right. So you can go to this website and you can go, Hey, I'm really interested in, in image classification, right? Or uh, YOLO, which is you only look once, which is a thing that says, what's a cat, what's a dog, right? So um, if you go to this particular thing, oh, let's picture up a cat with a box around it. That's cute. They'll, they'll tell you how to use the model, but what's great is they go, hey, there's a, here's some examples of how you can use it. And if you look at this P5 web editor, P5 is a JavaScript language that we use for games and super interactive kind of web content, right? Um, but if you go look at this image, it's this single image or this webcam image, what you really get is this piece of code. It's a, it's a, it's a piece of code that I will make smaller, all right? And basically what it's doing is it's saying, hey, uh, load the P5 uh, YOLO model, right? So at the very first thing I do is I go, hey, I'm gonna create a, a thing that is a model. And that's all we had to do to get that model to work is this one line of code. Um, P5 is broken up into a setup, which is sort of like Unity or any other gaming kind of platform, which is there's a setup where you do some things once, and then there is this um, concept of draw, which happens every frame on the screen. So this code runs over and over and over. Um, but what we've done is in setup, we set up a camera and we set up, a, hey, we're going to load an image, uh, and that's the cat image, right? And then what's going to happen is when that model gets loaded, then we're going to allow it to try to detect what that image is. So if I hit run right here, what's going to happen is you can see down here, it says detecting. And then it says, okay, here's the picture. And then if I examine the data that came back from the model, it's a cat. And it's 63.79% confident that it's a cat, right? You guys can see that. And where is the box that I would draw around it? And how big should that box be? Right? And then normalized means um, in what happens is we pass this image into that model and that model shrinks that image down, breaks it up into tons and tons of pieces and then comes back and says, here's where the cat is. And that's where it is in the model itself. So, um, but we said, okay, here's a cat. All right, just to make sure that you know that I'm not um, uh, making things up. I'm going to change this to cat2, which is another image that's in here. I'm going to go ahead and run it again. And it's going to go, okay, um, there's another cat. And what is it? Uh, that is also a cat. And it's 65% sure that it's a cat uh, in that image. Now, the quality of your model 
depends on whether or not you're going to understand what things are. So there's another, there's another image in here called a turtle. Um, and I'm going to pass in the turtle now. Um, okay. So turtle PNG, because uh, that's what that's called. I'm going to pass that in. And uh, that's, that's definitely a turtle, right? We all on this call would agree that that's a turtle. All right, good. Uh, the model, however, thinks it's a person. All right. And it is 56% sure that that is a picture of a person. Why is that? Well, because the image classifier either wasn't trained on what turtles are, or it wasn't trained on, uh, or it was trained with, I don't know, people that look like turtles. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, but so ML can be wrong. So we would want to go back and look at retraining this model, either providing more data into this model, more images, more truth, right? This is a supervised model. Um, or uh, we would just want to not let people put turtles into this model because we haven't we haven't done image classification on turtles yet, all right? So we could go. I'm not, I, you know, but this is 56 percent. It is over halfway sure that that's a person. We would want to look at how this model got trained. But it's important to understand machine learning is not infallible. Right? It's only as good as the model that was built and the data that's coming in versus the data that's coming out. The fact that we gave it a turtle and it tells us it's a person shows us there's a problem with this model, right? But it picked out the cats just fine. So apparently someone really likes cats and fed a lot of cats into that particular model. All right, so we'll go to another one real quick, which is similar, but this is using uh, a new, a different classifier. So we're still doing classifications, uh, but we're gonna do an image classifier on this one, right? And the image classifier that we're gonna run not only will tell us what the thing is, but it will give us a lot of information about it. So this one knows not only is it a bird, right, which is simple classification, but it's a American robin, uh, uh, tortoise, my, 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 my grandis, hmm, and it's 92% sure that it's a robin, right? And if we look at the, the results of the machine learning algorithm, right, the model, actually, when we passed in this bird picture, it came back with three results for what's in this picture. Because it came back with, hey, I'm 92% sure that that is a robin, but it also came back and said, hey, I think there's a fence in this picture. Because it didn't know that we were just looking for a bird. It didn't know we were looking for a robin. It said, I wanna identify anything in this picture I can possibly identify in this picture. And so it gives us a data set back that says, hey, um, I'm not sure what a worm fence is, but I, I'm pretty sure that that thing that the thing is sitting on is a uh, Virginia fence. And it's not super sure that that's a Virginia fence or not, but it's it's close. And, and it says, hey, there's some brambling or some other stuff in this background, but it's not very confident at all that it knows what anything in the, else in this picture is behind it. Right? So we can do the same thing here. We can say, hey, I want to see um, this. I want to, I don't I want the bird anymore. I want a kitten. Cool. Uh, we'll run that again. Oh, pretty kitten. That's cute. It's a tabby cat, and it, but it's only 18% sure it's a tabby cat. All right. So what else could it be? Well, if I look at it, it goes, yeah, it's 18% sure it's a tabby cat. Um, it, it's 12% sure that that could be an Egyptian cat. And it is 9% uh, sure that that could be a tiger cat. But since, since tabby cat was our highest confidence score, we went with that. And that's a lot of times what we're doing in ML is looking at when the, machine, when the model hands us back multiple results, we're looking for the highest confidence in that particular model. Right? And that's what's really going on behind a lot of machine learning that's out there. Um, there's a couple other ones that we can do. Um, this is, uh, oh, this is body pick segmentation. Uh, we don't want to do that. But essentially, this is a very simple, I'm going to switch back over to um, set of models. Hang on a second. If I switch back over to me, it will now look at it and go, ah, I can see a person. So it's doing body segmentation. So think of zoom backgrounds and some of those kind of things, right? Um, this particular model is able to determine what those are. Um, and then um, the last one is uh, words, right? So um, a tree is nearest to 
flowers, garden, deer, and that kind of, well, what about a building? What's a building near to in as far as words go? Oh, okay, oh, that makes sense. What about a hospital? What's related to a hospital? Ambulance, doctors, clinic. So we have models now that can look at language and understand the relationship between words, right? And then, you know, the car and a tire, what do they have in common? Vehicles, you know, fruit is to tree. This one sort of is weird. Uh, fruit is to tree as monkey is to snake. I'm that, I don't know why I came back with that, but that's what it came back with, right? So by, by being able to use some of these off the shelf models, we can start to understand and sort of play with them and sort of figure out what's going on. Now, um, unfortunately I had terrible time management because this is my first talk that I've done in a couple of months. Um, I have uh, uh, what I think is a pretty cool example of us going and building a model. I'm going to share this other screen. And this is, uh, you guys participated with me in this particular thing, all right? So we're gonna train a face recognition model um, based on you guys. Um, so I know that Katie and uh, Taylor have already volunteered for this particular thing, but I want some of the rest of you to volunteer for it as well. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to, uh, and you guys can see this screen, right? Yeah. I'm going to take um, Katie and I'm going to pin her onto my screen so I see her, right? I'm gonna come over, this is something from Google called Teachable Machine. And this is this will be in the link of the slide deck that you'll get. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna open up my webcam. So now everyone can see uh, this picture, I'll switch it around so it looks normal. Everyone can see Taylor in this picture, right? We all good? What I'm gonna do, Taylor, is I'm gonna take about 100 pictures of you because that's a good sample, right, what you can do. So you can make different faces, you can you know, do whatever, and you know, okay. So I'm just gonna start shooting some, some pictures of Taylor. And I'm just going to go ahead and stop about 100. Cause that's a, that's a good number of pictures. All right, cool. And we're gonna call this Taylor. All right. All right, now let's go, uh, let's go pick somebody else. Um, who else wants to be in here? Um, this, this, is, is anyone opposed to me just randomly picking people on this particular screen that has a screen up? No. All right. We'll do, Neil, we'll do you next. Just oh, great. <laughs> I should have objected. I, I asked. Uh, so we'll say, okay, this is uh, Neil. Cool. So we're going to make a Neil class. And I'm going to start that same webcam. And again, just be, be yourself. Smile. Be happy. Wow. Okay, fine. I'm gonna take about 100 pictures of Neil. Uh, good, all right, so now we have um, we have a Neil class and a Taylor class. We could do more if we wanted to, but since we're since I went over in time, I'll well, we'll just go ahead and do it. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna train a model based on this two sets of data, right? And if I look at it, I can go, hey, I'm doing 50 epochs, which is essentially 50 iterations through it. I can look at batch size. I can look at a bunch of different stuff, but What's interesting is it comes out with a model at the end that says, hey, that's Neil, right? So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna switch that back over to Taylor and it's gonna go, hey, that's Taylor. So we just built a model that knows the difference between Neil and Taylor um, simply by their face, right? So if I go, where's Neil? Or hi, Neil, there you go. If I go back to Neil, um, now what I'll do is I'll just say, okay, um, uh, uh, Taylor, go ahead and say something. Hey, how's it going? Oh, hang on, I must not. I must still have Neil pinned. I'm not done. And all right, all right. Now, now Neil, go ahead and say something. Let's let's get back and forth between the two. Uh, AWH is awesome. We got it. Knows it's Neil. All right, Taylor, continue on with the revelry. I love working for AWH. So. There you go. What we've just done was taken a facial recognition model. Um, well, actually trained one, we built one. We took a bunch of pictures of Taylor. We took a bunch of pictures of Neil. We trained a model and now we're consuming that model in real time um, based on what's going on with the screen that we have. Um, and we can do this with uh, body positioning. We can do this with noise. We can do that. I like, um, there's a couple of, if you go to Teachable Machine, which is what this is, um, I'll move this back out so you're not, you're not, if you go to Teachable Machine, um, 
you can then go into this particular thing and go, hey, I want to do an image project, which is what we just did, or an audio project or a pose project. And you can go build your own models. Now, what's nice is um, that model that we built, right? I can actually download this model and I can use it in my own application. So anytime Taylor or Neil are in the same, I know who they are just by their picture. And if we had done this with every person on the Zoom call, which we could do, right? I would know, I would be able to identify each person on the Zoom call as soon as they started talking. And you, so you can sort of think through, well, if it's that easy to build an, a, a model at this point. Now, there's all kinds of problems with the particular model, right? One is, uh, it's two people, so how useful, right? But at the same time, um, what if I used a similar kind of process to go, hey, I want, I want a door security in our office, and I want to know when people are coming and going. So I can hook up a Nest camera, I can feed it through a model, and it will tell me when employees are coming and going out of the office because it knows who they are by their face, and it will tell me when people we don't know are in the office. Right? That's a day or two worth of work to put something like that together. So this, this concept of machine learning is really outside of the ability for businesses to use because it's, um, you know, difficult and just, uh, it's just, you can't even get started and you have to have a PhD before you can even begin to do those kind of things. That's not true anymore. The, mo the, the, the tools that we have are better. The uh, techniques that we have are better. The understanding that we have is better. Our data is better. Um, and then with things like uh, reinforcement learning and even like this, you know, you know, the, the bar to get into machine learning is lower and lower. And there's really no reason, even if you're not a programmer, like nothing we did here required you to even know what code was. Now, if I want to take this model and go embed it in an application, probably are going to need to some of that. But I could take this model and I can export it. If we go back over to our little screen. I can export that model right here. I can say, hey, I want that model. And it'll go, um, I want to download that model. And TensorFlow is what this is using underneath the hood because it's Google, obviously. Um, but that P5 language that we have is right here, right? And I can actually open this up in the P5 web editor, which is what we've been using for the other ones. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn this Teachable machine off. And then I'm going to turn this one on, right? We're going to feed, um, I haven't done this before, so we're totally in uncharted territory at this point. I'm just going to put it on um, Taylor, just for funsies. So it's got here, and I'm, I'm running this particular project right now. No, what should we do? Oh, this is looking for daytime, nighttime. Yeah, see, I shouldn't have done that. <clears throat> but let's just pretend I didn't do that, and then we'll go on from there. Yeah. So, um, but again, I think in closing, machine learning is not uh, something that you should uh, a be afraid of. Um, it's the it's the implementation of machine learning, and uh, you know um, that you should be really looking at as to how are these models being used. That is the ethical problem for businesses. Um, but should your business look at machine learning as a, as a opportunity? Yeah, um, because A, the bar has become low. It's super integratable. Um, it's, it's something that pretty consistently works and you can always improve it. Um, and it saves you a lot of time and code complexity by being able to do that kind of work.